During an induction ceremony, most of you by now know a proposed member is given certain rules. And one of those rules are, you're not to put your hands on another member. In fact, it was the only rule that had an exception. As Maddie Madonna told me, if someone puts their hands on you first, kill them, and then we'll deal with it. What wasn't said, but was commonly known, is no one is supposed to put their hands on a member. And that went for civilians as well. The penalty was a death sentence. You put your hands on a friend, a member, you die, which segues us into today's video. For those of you who may not know, Joey DiBenedetto is a Lucchese member who's the son-in-law of the Lucchese boss, Vicar Musso. Joey became inducted at a fairly young age, sometime in the 90s. Some people think he was inducted because of nepotism, but that couldn't be any further than the truth. In our neighborhood, Joey was known to be a very tough kid. And if it wasn't a Lucchese's, one of the other five families would have snatched him up. Admittingly, after his induction, Joey had said he was running around wild. He told me we were shaking everybody down and gambling like crazy. And when we lost bets, we told bookies they weren't getting paid. At the time, I didn't get to see the way Joey was acting because I was in prison. When I did see my friend again, he was not only matured, but level-headed as well. He'd been through and seen a lot, especially the decline of the life. He always gave good sound advice and never flaunted his status. I believe I mentioned in the past, Joey could have easily gained the captain's position, but chose not to. Not long after being inducted, one night, Joey took his wife out to a lounge in Brooklyn. Back then, if you were a guy from Queens and going to a club or bar in Brooklyn, you were asking for trouble and vice versa. For the most part, these were territorial neighborhoods. As he explained it to me, he was in a place with his wife and everything was going fine. But at some point, his wife misplaced her Louis Vuitton pocketbook. They began looking all around for it, and at some point, his wife spotted another girl walk by with the pocketbook, or what she thought was her pocketbook. So she went over to Joey and told him that the woman had her bag. Joey naturally confronted the woman, who was a neighborhood girl and knew most of the Brooklyn guys in the place that night. So while Joey was questioning her about the bag, a few guys started to walk over, and one thing led to another and words were exchanged. Joey said he noticed they were starting to surround them, so he began throwing punches. He laughed when he told me he was banging them up. One of their friends noticed that Joey was doing a number on his friends, broke a bottle, and snuck up behind Joey and cut him on the side of his temple. When Joey was telling me the story, his wife was there and she interjected. She said, I was hysterical because blood was squirting out of his head. I was screaming, saying he's going to die. Joey looked at me and was laughing, remembering how his wife was screaming that night. He said, that's all I remember was her screaming. Obviously, they got Joey to a hospital. I don't know if he went in an ambulance or they drove him there and he received stitches for the long cut on the side of his head. As usual, the streets talk and the gossip began. The Brooklyn guys were bragging about the fight and how their friend Mikey stepped in and cut a guy's head open with a broken bottle. As a result of all this gossip, for the first time, they learned it wasn't just some guy, but a member of the Lucchese family. And the Mikey that they were referring to was Mikey Yanati, a Gambino associate at the time. Yanati grew up in Canarsie, Brooklyn, where he became an associate of Nicky Carrazzo's crew. He was also known as a neighborhood tough guy and would eventually become a member of the Gambino family, but at that time, he was just an associate. Not long after this incident took place with Joey, the Guardian Angels found that Curtis Sliwa began verbally bashing the Gotti clan, using words that describe John Gotti as public enemy number one and America's number one drug deal. He would also go on to blame Gotti for spreading crack cocaine. Unable to handle any form of criticism, the Gotti clan responded. On April 23rd, 1992, Sliwa was attacked outside his Avenue A and St. Mark's Place apartment by four guys with baseball bats. As a result of the beating, he received 12 stitches to his head, a broken wrist, and a fractured elbow. But even that didn't stop Sliwa from bashing the Gottis. So another plan was put in motion. The original plan called for Sliwa to be kidnapped and given a severe beating. The guys who were chosen to carry this out were Gambino Associates Joey D'Angelo and Mikey Yanati. On July 19, 1992, D'Angelo and Yanati were in a stolen cab. D'Angelo was the driver, and Yanati crouched down in the passenger seat. On that morning, Sliwa, like most mornings, hailed a cab outside his East Village apartment that would take him to the WABC radio studios. As luck would have it, he hailed the wrong cab that day. With their target in the cab, D'Angelo pulled away, and according to reports, Yanati jumped up with a silver-plated pistol and told Sliwa, 
take this, you son of a bitch, and shot him three times. The cab had been fixed with no door handles and both windows were closed. After being shot in his torso, Sliwa jumped over Yanadi and out the passenger window. According to Sliwa, he became a human speed bump. But luckily for him, he survived the shooting and the fall. Well, the hunt is on tonight. Mayor Dinkins is pledging his help to find the gunman who ambushed and shot Curtis Sliwa. The Guardian Angels founder and leader is recovering from surgery at Bellevue Hospital tonight. Curtis Sliwa is still in critical condition at this hour after undergoing more than six hours of surgery to remove five bullets. He's expected to recover fully from his injuries in a shooting that took place this morning at exactly the same place where he'd been attacked by three men with baseball bats two months earlier. In 2004, Yanadi would go on trial for an 11-count racketeering indictment. Racketeering Act 1 charged him with conspiring to kidnap, kidnapping, and attempted murder of Curtis Sliwa. When the jury gave their verdict, they felt the government didn't prove the attempted murder and were deadlocked on the conspiracy charges. Ultimately, Yanadi was convicted of racketeering and sentenced to 20 years. Okay, let's get back to the story. As I mentioned, word spread. And now knowing that a member of the Lucchese family was assaulted, Yanadi knew he had a problem. Not only did he put his hands on a maid member, but it was a boss's son-in-law, and he did it in front of the boss's daughter. Joey explained to me, although he was justified to push for Yanadi to pay with his life or receive a beating, he decided to leave it alone. I asked him why, and he told me in a way that displays his humbleness. John, do you know how many guys I gave beatings to and hurt? He didn't know who I was at the time of the fight, so I just left it alone. What he said about a person not knowing who he's dealing with is true. The average person doesn't know and shouldn't know who you are. Most of us in the life knew the public was at a disadvantage when dealing with us. We may not win the battle, but we'll win the war. I learned that the more power you gain, the more humble you should become. And Joey lived his life that way too. With that said, the reverse of that is having a you can't put your hands on me mentality, which is not good. Big John one time explained an incident that took place after I had left the restaurant Zio Toto. During an argument, someone grabbed Big John's wrist aggressively, and he told the guy, you're putting your hands on me? I was embarrassed listening to him, a captain at the time, admit he said those words. He should have just acted. There was no need to talk. And he did the same thing when a few bananos chased the guy into the cigar lounge and began giving the guy a beat. Big John knew the guy, and he tried to intervene. And one guy either grabbed him or pushed him. At a sit-down with the Bananos, Big John made a big issue that they put their hands on him. So look at the difference between Big John and Little Joey. I've covered in a past video, which I'll add a link in this video's description, of a Lucchese member getting cracked in his face. Presently, made members getting assaulted have become more common. I'll be covering assaults that took place on other members in upcoming videos. I want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for their time. I know we all have lives and responsibilities, so I think it's important to thank viewers for taking the time to watch these videos. I hope you enjoyed it, and as usual, please remember to hit the like button. It helps with the algorithm on YouTube. In a recent community poll, I asked who made a better gangster, Jimmy Burke or John Gotti, and 74% picked Jimmy Burke, and I happen to agree with you. I appreciate everyone who participated. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do so so that you could be notified whenever I post a new video. And if you think friends and family might enjoy this video, please share it and thank you. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and I'll catch you on the next one.